January 17th, 2017, protesting the death penalty, calling for the abolition of the death penalty. Um, we wanted to just start off by thanking all of you all for coming out and uh, thanking specifically Andy, who's helped us so much from George Washington University. He's the gallery director here, and he's the whole reason that we've been able to get this space, get this space, and uh, make so much happen. <coughs> we also want to thank our uh, collaborators, the Center, Center for Constitutional Rights, uh, Witness Against Torture, the National Coalition to Protect Civil Freedoms. Um, I also wanted to thank Siobhan Rigg, um, who uh, is a professor here, who was instrumental in allowing the Tea Project to be in this place at this time. And uh, we're also just so humbled by the fact that we get to show the project, the Tea Project, along the side of Jamal and Golub's work. As you know, Jamal has been transferred to Guantanamo, um, but Golub is still there, despite the fact that he's been cleared for transfer, and all of those works by him have been made since he was cleared. So all those works, those beautiful, beautiful works, and in many ways, according to some of the letters that CCR shared with him, are his sharing, trying to figure out how to have hope and focusing on the beauty which is really what the T project is about. It's about finding beauty despite. So just to give a little bit of background um, about the two of us, um, my name is Aaron Hughes. I'm an Iraq veteran. I uh, served in Iraq from 2003 through 2004. I was a truck driver. Right after I got back, I actually met Kathy Kelly mm -hmm. at the University of Illinois and uh, meeting her along with members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War began a process of radicalization, I guess, and uh, I got very active with Iraq Veterans Against the War. But in 2009, I was really humbled to have the opportunity to return to Iraq as a civilian. And I went to the first International Labor Conference in Erbil, Iraq, where I was hearing stories from all these workers from all over Iraq that I had never heard was before. Were stories from the Electrical Union, who had forced the U.S. military nonviolently out of their power plants after months and months of struggle. Stories about the oil workers in the South who forced the British military out of their oil fields despite the fact they were being occupied nonviolently again. <coughs> Stories I never heard about. Just completely humbling. And my job was to witness that and bring it back and share that with all of you. And then the conference organizers, they turned to me and they said, okay, it's your turn. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 I don't think you understand. I was I was in your country, I was a soldier. They're like, no, th you are a peace delegate, it's your turn to speak. And so I went in front of this crowd of some 400 workers, you know, like three times the size of this auditorium. And I told them I was there in their country. And I pointed my weapon at their families and at their communities. And for that, I was sorry. But I wasn't there for forgiveness, I was there to take responsibility. And I told him about Camila Mejia, the first NCO who got back from Iraq and refused to redeploy. About Aaron Wattai, the first officer who refused to deploy to Iraq and went to jail. The countless other service members that went to Canada or went AWOL. I told him about all of you, how the American people didn't support the war in Iraq. And at the end of the talk, this man jumps up in the back of the auditorium and starts shaking his hand and yelling something really loud in Arabic and despite all of the great cultural sensitivity training from the U.S. military. <laughs> I still don't know any Arabic. And uh, he's just booking it down to the stage. And uh, you know, keeps shaking his hand, and he's yelling really loud, and I'm just like, okay, this is it. You know, this guy's gonna come beat the shit out of me. <laughs> and that's fine. This is his country. It's what I deserve. And just as the man comes up on stage, I hear the translation come through the little earpiece. I just want to come up on stage and give this gentleman a hug! And he grabs me. <laughs> and he hugs me. And I learned that this man, he was in the Iraqi military and fought against the invading forces. He was in the oil workers union and pushed the British military out of his oil fields. And there he was, hugging me. Well, of course, I started to cry. And I guess a 6'5 guest from the United States crying in front of some 400 workers listened to the conference organizer's idea of a good time. So they quickly surrounded me, and they took me off the stage, and they brought me out of 
I thought I told him they sat me down. And the, for the first time in my life, despite the fact that I was offered over and over and over again during my deployment, every time I refused, every time I ever said, no, I can't drink that, I was offered tea for the first time. That was the first time I had Iraqi tea. And it was that generosity despite, that generosity that has offered me this, during my whole deployment from the Iraqis, from the Kuwaitis, from third country nationals, despite. It's that beauty despite, and that generosity despite, that I felt needed to come back and be brought back <coughs> to all of you. And so that's the foundation of this project. And that the same year I went to Iraq in 2009, my friend Chris Arendt, he went on a speaking tour with some of the individuals that he guarded while he was a guard in Guantanamo. His story is about walking up the cells and taking the contraband out of the cells in Guantanamo. And he said he never liked to work the day shift because he, he'd always want to apologize to them. And he said it was the quickest way to learning how to become a concentration camp guard. And he said every single time he had to take this contraband out of their cells because at that time they were only allowed to have a styrofoam cup of tea after dinner. <coughs> it's the only thing in their cells. And they would take these cups and they started drawing and scrawling all over the cups. And the military couldn't handle this. This was an example of self-expression. It's against the rules. It was a security threat. So Chris's job was to go around and confiscate these cups, take them down to military intelligence where they'd analyze them, and then throw them away. <coughs> As if somehow someone was going to write a secret message and throw it in the ocean and it was going to get back to somebody somewhere. Yeah. It's absurd. Chris said every single time he went to go pick up those cups, <coughs> they'd just be scrawled all over with flowers. Just flowers. So those, that's the basis of the story for these cups that we've now cast. So on the cups, some of them will have a lot of flowers, and some of them will have just a few. There's 48 countries um, that are represented, um, representative of the citizen. There's 47, 48 countries that are represented, the citizenship um, in Guantanamo. Every one of these cups <coughs> has the national or indigenous flower of that country. My name is Amber Ginsberg, and I was invited by Aaron into this project to transform the styrofoam cups into porcelain. And the question became, how do we translate this love story onto these cups? And we decided to translate it through a kind of beautiful statistic. Um, this is a cup from Afghanistan, <coughs> 220 men from Afghanistan have been detained in Guantanamo, and carved into this cup are 220 tulips, the national flower of Afghanistan. And this is a cup from Algeria, and it has the number of men from Algeria with the national flower on it. Mm -hmm. um, these cups, they're not ours. We don't consider them ours. They're on loan. The ultimate goal for these objects is their return. We would like to either return the cups to detainees or to arts or cultural organizations in their country of origin. At the end of the evening, if you can place your cup in this box and we'll have a place on the table, we want to be able to take these cups to their place of origin. The material that this is cast in is porcelain. Porcelain is our strong clay. Any clay that's fired is our strongest cultural material. It's where we learn to read culture. And we want this story and these men's names and this, these forms of torture and injustice always remembered. And with that, I'm going to read a poem. September 8th, 2012, alleged cause of death suicide. I can't remember their names. May 18th, 2011, the alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names. February 2nd, 2011, the alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names. June 1st, 2009, the alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names. December 30th, 2007, the alleged cause of death, cancer. I can't remember their names. May 30th, 2007, the alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember the names, June 10th, 2006, alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names, June 10th, 2006, 
2006, alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names. June 10th, 2006, alleged cause of death, suicide. I can't remember their names. Adnan, Fernan, Abdul, Latif. Anatolia, Ahul Gol, Muhammad, Ahmed, Abdullah, Salim, Alhanshi. Abdullah, Razik, Ahmed. Abdullah, Rahman, Mata, Tafir, Al Hamari. Nasir, Talil, Al Zaharni. Mana, Shaman, Al Abardi, Al Taibi. Ali, Abdullah, Ahmed. I can't remember the names. Great. So, my name is Barak Shanraja. I'm the co director of the Washington Peace. Center. Uh, it is a local organization. The district does a lot of grassroots work providing support for movements. Before I go in and start, I do want to say that we are talking today about a very heavy topic. As we're talking about resistance to state violence, just in a few days, we know that Trump will be inaugurated. And our grassroots movements are going to be on the front lines fighting and resisting. And so it's important that all of you in this room who are showing up take care of yourselves. Um, our long-term goal is liberation. It's the long term, so please do not burn yourself out and really take care of yourself. This topic for me is actually very heavy. Um, I'm Muslim. I have an uncle who was picked up from the UK, put into black sites, uh, tortured, and then killed. Um, and he was labeled a terrorist. And our family was told that if you tried to seek justice, they would come from my other cousins in Pakistan. And so when we talk about the war on terror, which Guantanamo Bay is one of those policies, it is a <coughs> maximum security prison. If we talk about the United States, we know that we're living in a country which uses mass incarceration as a caste-based system, as a racism system, and it uses it with the goal of controlling communities of color, destroying our communities, and also entrenching fear. Think about it just not as a prison with now a few dozen prisoners left, but rather as a symbolic sort of institution that tells Muslims globally that there is an institution, a prison built just for you because you are so not human that you deserve to be tortured, you deserve to receive punishment, you do not have the right um, to a due process, you are guilty because of your <coughs> Muslim identity, and it doesn't matter what happens to you. And the fact that this blatant violation, this blatant Islamophobic institution exists to this day should tell us that when we talk about the war on terror, when we talk about things like Guantanamo Bay, that centering Muslim communities and centering people directly impacted is vital for this movement and also moving forward. Eight years ago, when Obama was actually brought into office, I remember clearly that particularly Guantanamo Bay was an issue that many folks from a human rights lens were celebrating, thinking that he would close Guantanamo Bay down. Now that we're here, if any of you are watching the hearings today with Jeff uh, Sessions, you know one of the things that he said is that he's going to continue to keep Guantanamo Bay open and they're actually going to buff it up even more. Donald Trump has said the same thing. And I think this is a moment of introspection for the grassroots movement as to what did we do? How did we lose this issue? How is it that eight years later, this prison is still around? And I think one of the mistakes that our movement did is it didn't center impacted communities. It didn't center the folks, the family members of people tortured. It didn't center Islamophobia. What it did is made it so broad to human rights that it actually took away from the communities that were actually being targeted. Another mistake that we did is that we didn't understand the ways in which the national security narrative, the equation of Muslims as terrorists, is one of our biggest barriers <coughs> to getting anything in terms of state policy around Muslim communities to be gone. And so when we talk about Guantanamo Bay, the moment they say the word terrorists, we lose a lot of social support. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what Muslims in our humanity is. People see us only through their lens as terrorists, and that's about it. So I think, again, as you are listening today to the powerful speakers that will be up here, people who are directly impacted, people who are dedicated their lives to doing, doing this work, we must also be really introspective and honest with ourselves as to what did we do in the last eight years? How did we lose this issue? Because at the end of the day, people are dying, people are being impacted, people's mental health is being impacted, we're talking about a global system, a global war on terror since 9-11 that has resulted in more than seven Muslim-majority nations being bombed, at least a million people killed. 
we do not have any more privilege to sit around and just let this issue go on. We have to get honest. And I think the way we do that is to center directly impacted folks. And while, yes, in some larger place we want human rights and collective liberation, that cannot be at the expense of actually erasing the communities that are directly impacted. Woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on freedom. Hallelujah.